No, it is not. But each time is always uh, full of adventure, full of exciting things to see. And I've been to Jeju. I've been to Busan. I've been to several uh, places here. And it's always a very exciting uh, visit. All I know about Hallyu is that it has changed. It's a game changer. It has changed how uh, Korea relates to the world, to the whole world, not just to the Philippines, in the sense that it has uh, increased exponentially uh, getting to know uh, cultures uh, we, uh, of one country uh, 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 to another country, bridging. It's a very, it's a big game changer. So in, in, in that sense, I can say that uh, Hallyu uh, put Korea uh, in the consciousness of many Filipinos, but I'm sure also in many other uh, countries. And uh, the young people of today, they're more in touch with each other because there are more things to talk about. What are these things? In, well, in addition to singing and dancing and all that, I think Hallyu has um, brought about a consciousness about topics that young people are interested in now. But it has opened the doors for young people of the world through Korea to get to know each other and to be to be share to share their views about social issues of social uh, concern. Do you know that my granddaughter is my conscience uh, about many social and political issues? I'll give you an example. An example. It happened only this morning. My first uh, activity was to go to the ASEAN Korea Center, which is like 10 minutes, uh, a 10 minute walk from my hotel. So she said, are you going to walk to uh, the center? I said, no. I said, why not? An ambassador has to be dignified. I have to arrive there in full, you know, diplomatic uh, car and all that. Why? Have you not thought of the carbon em emission that you will be? <laughs> so oh, we have this uh, frequent debates. My, my granddaughter is an international studies uh, major. I'm trying to influence her to become a diplomat, but uh, you know, she has all these uh, uh, political, social issues. Uh, but I told her um, the best place to change government is to be inside government. She's the one correcting me about my pronouns, uh, to be more gender sensitive. I'm a literature major. I'm very particular with my personal pronouns, singular and plural and all that. She makes my, uh, she, she prepares all my Canva presentations and she changes my pronouns. So instead I put there his, her you know, traditional, uh, and then she re removes that. She puts there. I said, that's grammatically wrong. <laughs> and she says, no, it's uh, politically and socially sensitive. Okay, but when I give my Canva, I, uh, I erase her uh, politically correct. <laughs> I insist on my grammatically correct. <laughs> no, but uh, what I'm saying is that uh, young people today, they are, you know, uh, Maybe they are into all these uh, entertainment uh, uh, activities, but do not misjudge them. They like K-pop. She's a Monsta X favorite, so sorry, ARMY. <laughs> but at the same time, very conscious of political and social issues. And so uh, uh, they have um, a vessel now. They have the platform now to talk to each other about all this climate change, about all these issues. Thank you very much for that question. It's a question close to my heart uh, because, uh, as I said earlier, I want people to be more aware about the women agenda uh, in all platforms. Uh, uh, 
First of all, I'd like to say that the Philippines has a feminist foreign policy. Whenever I go to negotiate agreements and you know uh, uh, talk to our external partners, number one is the in, we have a, a, a list of favorite things in the Philippine foreign policy, and of course one of them is South China Sea, migrant workers concerns, and then women, the promotion protection of the rights of uh, women. So my marching orders are to always put there in the in the agreement or in the uh, uh, cooperation the women's agenda. Um, a little tidbit: uh, Do you know that the now famous CEDO Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, uh, which is the Bill of Rights of uh, the Rights and uh, of Women? was drafted by two Filipino uh, women diplomats, uh, Senator uh, Leticia ramos Shahani and uh, 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 Dr. Patricia Likwanan. And they campaigned very hard in the UN to have it approved and uh, ratified by all uh, countries of ASEAN. So uh, to show you the, the you know, the, that this is, uh, these are our marching orders whenever we go abroad. And uh, on our part, on my part, um, I, uh, I was chair of um, six ASEAN bodies in, when the Philippines was chair of ASEAN. And we might say that uh, the Philippines, uh, together with other ASEAN member states, uh, led the championing of women's issues in ASEAN. During our chairmanship, we uh, uh, rallied all the other member states to issue the first ever ASEAN statement, leader statement on women, peace and security to emphasize the role of women in the peace and security. Who else would be more interested in peace and security but women? Yeah. So peacekeeping, peace uh, reconciliation and, and uh, agreements and everything. Uh, and then uh, the other uh, important leader statement is uh, called the uh, uh, gender sensitive implementation of the ASEAN Community Vision, as uh, you know, the ASEAN Community Vision has three pillars, political security pillar, economic pillar, sociocultural pillar. What that means is that uh, when you implement all of this, you have to put the gender lens, the gender, uh, it's a gendered approach. So, but because most of the time, uh, people tend to put it only under sociocultural women's issues, your sociocultural, uh, nothing wrong with that, but what we are saying is put it there in the economic empowerment of women. And so therefore, uh, one of the tangible results of this is uh, the formation of the AUN, ASEAN Women Economic Network. You know? So uh, women issues is not just sociocultural, it's also economic and many others, but and also political security. Because of, uh, in uh, peace processes and reconciliation, for example, the peace agreements or the peace that is negotiated by women tends to be more sustainable. Why? Because women put on the gender lens. Right now, I cannot see people at the back. But when I put on my lens, I can see clearly. It's the same. Some people cannot see problems uh, as they look. But when you put on the gender lens, you can see other things that other people uh, won't uh, be able to see. For example, uh, well, not to denigrate men. Men are our supporters. We add our uh, sources of inspiration. But uh, sometimes men are interested in disarming, you know, the rebels and all that. Yeah, it's also an important part of uh, peace negotiations. But women, they will include the welfare of the children. 
poverty alleviation, education, etc. So women's gender lenses, they are more sharp at other things. So okay, so we champion this in ASEAN and it has uh, those two agreements have given birth to more concrete action uh, by ASEAN so that last year they issued the regional plan. It's so difficult to negotiate that because of the different levels of uh, development in ASEAN. But now, um, under the leadership of Cambodia, they came up with a regional plan of action on enhancing the role of women in all the pillars of uh, society. I joined the Foreign Service in 1981. But of course, the Philippine Foreign Service was already open in the sense that uh, the examination, one of the most difficult uh, ever, and certainly the most difficult in the Philippines, uh, is, was open, is still open to all. That is why, but more women pass the Foreign Service uh, examination. And so uh, that's how I joined the Philippine Foreign Service. But uh, even so, I would say that uh, it's been a long climb upwards. I don't know if I'm already on, on top, but uh, at least I reached vice minister level last, uh, for, for my, the last leg of my career. Uh, uh, Ambassador Tess was also vice minister level. We've had a very short stint of a first female uh, secretary minister for foreign affairs. Um, but in my time, you still had to work three times as hard to prove that you're the equal or the better part of the of a career, for a career of foreign service. You really had to work twice as hard. and. Uh, I, I've not always been like this. I'm very old now, but uh, uh, in my younger days, I, of course, uh, had some kind of a demeanor, a pleasant demeanor, you might say, and that, is, that worked against me. If you have a pretty face, you were not considered seriously, even if you all, both, all of you similarly passed the Foreign Service examination. But that has been conquered uh, through hard work. And you know, just proving yourself to, I didn't have any agenda, but to serve my country and my people and to serve God. This was my philosophy, so never mind, don't, you know. Many, I have gone through a very difficult career, uh, but that's, you know, move on to the next. That's part of your training. Adversity is your best friend uh, in the career foreign service. Anyway, so it happened then, but I will tell you that today it's still happening. I just came from a, a country. I had a meeting there. It was in the province and uh, I was the head of the Philippine delegation. My deputy was a man, okay? So we met this uh, very high provincial leader and I was, you know, standing beside my deputy who was a male, uh, you know, diplomat. I was about to say thank you for all your hospitality to this uh, gentleman, uh, government leader. Uh, what happened was um, he, he, he didn't look at me, talk to my male counter, my male deputy. And so I had to slowly move away. This is the still practice, gender stereotyping is still practice. And I talk to many women, diplomats, they also experience this. For example, if the woman is the ambassador and then the husband is, um, is not an ambassador, people immediately presume that the husband is the ambassador. So I, I, uh, it's a bit uh, disconcerting that I experienced this uh, myself uh, only recently. So what, uh, then uh, you come to realize people mouth, people like to say we are gender sensitive, uh, gender mainstreaming and all that, but we need a major overhaul 
in the thinking of, of, uh, of, of everybody, everybody that, uh, you know, uh, my granddaughter calls it uh, a microaggression to remove some of these uh, uh, symbols or, 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 or signs of microaggression against the women uh, population of the diplomatic uh, service. But overall, uh, you know, uh, compared to other countries, the Philippines is leading. Um, the, the UN index, uh, we are now slightly lower. We're only one of two countries in Asia where women are uh, women diplomats are uh, placed in decision making roles but we used to be higher but because of you know political appointments you know what i mean there were more male political appointees but if you talk about career women based on merits there are more uh, filipino women diplomats Okay, I'll give you an example. In the ASEAN capitals, next month, uh, the, the, there are currently three, only three male ambassadors in the 10 positions in ASEAN. 10 because in Jakarta you have two, the mission to, the, to ASEAN and the bilateral ambassador. Both of them are women. Next month, the male ambassador in, Jakar in Malaysia will leave, so there will be only two more men ambassadors. All the others are women. So, um, uh, yeah, we are leading, but we still need to do more uh, because of political and other pressures. Comparatively speaking, we're better off than most uh, countries. Uh, but uh, maybe job opportunities for the future. Uh, because of the great digital transformation taking place, uh, women are not traditionally assigned to do the technical job. And not many women are taking on this position. Uh, so I think that the biggest challenge will be how to, you know, invite uh, women to take on more traditionally uh, job, more traditional jobs in the future uh, in, in the area of digital uh, transformation. Also, in the area of politics, women in the Philippines lag behind. Uh, you know, p politics is a very difficult uh, profession. Uh, the, the trend now is for the wife of the mayor, for example, or the wife of the congressman, uh, to become also a politician, because since they are already there in that kind of lifestyle, they also t take it on. But it's a very, it's a limited phenomenon. So women uh, have to be uh, encouraged to, jo to join political or decision-making positions. This is a book I wrote about ASEAN centrality. Why did I write this book? Uh, in 2019, if you look at, uh, if you read page one of this book, in 2019, Foreign Minister Retno, who's a woman, of course, uh, called a me high-level meeting of all the external partners of ASEAN. So you have US, uh, Japan, Korea, of course, China, everybody, and, of all, and the 10 member states, to um, a high-level conference on the Indo-Pacific strategy. Okay. And everybody said they supported ASEAN centrality. But as I continued to listen to all of them, everyone has a different definition of what ASEAN centrality is. ASEAN centrality is a concept or a principle in ASEAN that we keep on insisting in ASEAN. In fact, there, I have a little unit there, a chapter there. Why does ASEAN keep on insisting you have to respect ASEAN centrality. 
in the Charter of the ASEAN, ASEAN uh, no, no, not in the Charter, in the, the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, ASEAN Centrality. Why does ASEAN keep on insisting? I think uh, it is a byproduct of our colonial past when we were told to do what to do and what not to do. And of course, it is also a byproduct of the uh, Cold War stigma of earlier years. And so ASEAN has to assert what ASEAN centrality is. And yet, the literature that you find on ASEAN centrality is made or de defined by academics. I don't have anything against academics, but their point of view is academic. <laughs> Somebody who has practiced ASEAN should write a definition of ASEAN centrality from the point of view of a practitioner. So I did that. That is not really inspired, but urged me <laughs> to write this book. So in this book, I define ASEAN centrality from the point of view of a practitioner and uh, of course the processes we should follow the ASEAN processes etc but can I may I just uh, uh, invite uh, diplomats and even non-diplomats even businessmen even um, international organizations regional organizations if you want to understand how to do business with ASEAN, please read this book because it will tell you how you can obtain the most uh, benefit from our cooperation uh, with each other. And might I, I add that 100% of the royalties go to charity.